Afternoon. All right, join me as we pray. Father in heaven, we rejoice to know that we are called your children. God, we rejoice in your salvation. We rejoice there's nothing we could have done apart from you to be saved. God, we are so thankful for your mercy and your kindness and your patience towards us. God, I pray this morning, I lift up the church in Canada. God, I lift up Pastor Coates up there who is thrown in prison, God, thrown in jail for proclaiming your good news. God, he made a stand. I pray for the church in Canada, God, that many of them would rise up today, that they would worship without fear, only fearing you, God. And I pray, God, that us in America would have the same courage to stand up and not hide, to proclaim the good news of Christ from our pulpits across the nation, because we know it's the only hope we have. God, I pray this morning you encourage your church, your church globally. We know, God, that you are casting your enemies under your feet. You are winning the nations, but at this time it looks bleak. But, God, we know that you are working it. We know that your plan, what you have set forth, is to conquer your enemies and to bring righteousness on this land and on this world. So, God, today, as we come before you as a church, as we sing, as we make war, Simply by singing. God, I pray you want to vindicate your name. Yes, Lord. God, this day, give us courage. Give us courage this week as we go out of this place. As we start here, we worship you. We worship before your throne. And we go out into the world. Give us courage. Help us never to fear men, God. I pray, too, for Pastor Eric this morning as he brings your word. God, may our hearts be ready. May our hearts receive your word. May they change us. God, may they strike deep blows, but may they be a tender mercy. God, I pray for our children as well. As they sit in here among us, as they hear the word proclaimed, as they hear their parents sing, as they hear their grandparents sing. God, I pray you will bless our children. The next generation of One Life Church sits in this place, God. The next generation of your church sits here and listens to the word proclaimed. God, I pray you will raise them up to be stronger than us braver than us and more courageous than us. Father, that your word would go forth from our children. Today, God, we're asking your spirit to come down in power. We're asking you to bless this place, to use us, God, for your glory as we worship you. In your son's name I pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stand for the reading of God's word. We're in Matthew chapter 24. We're going to read verses 1 through 28. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these? Do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And he sat on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then... Many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this is the gospel of the kingdom. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in the house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For that there will be a great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, it never will be. 
And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray if possible even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand, so that if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. May God bless the reading of the word. May be seen. So this uh, chapter is often referred to as the Olivet Discourse, and the reason for that was it was given uh, at the Mount of Olives, which the Mount of Olives was a mountain filled with olive trees. Uh, I know, surprising. Uh, it was on the east side of Jerusalem, east of the, the temple. And when you read through the Bible, the Mount of Olives, um, it comes up a lot. It is obviously a very, very significant place, uh, and, and God uh, drove this point home throughout the Bible. Let me give you a few examples. It was here that Jesus was betrayed and arrested. From this mountain is where he ascended into heaven. And immediately afterward, the angels told the disciples that Jesus would return here. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go to heaven. In the Old Testament, we know that the prophet Zechariah described in great detail how he would arrive. And it said, on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. The prophet Ezekiel, who was taken from Babylon exile in around 5 97 BC foresaw that God's glory would one day leave the temple and rest on the Mount of Olives. Ezekiel 11, 23 says, the glory of the Lord went out from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. And those are just a few examples, and I'm setting that up to say this, that it was clearly no mere coincidence that Jesus, after he left the temple and he declared anathema on it, which is, which is what he did, he declared anathema on the temple, which declaring anathema on the temple was declaring anathema on the old covenant, on the nation of Israel. The glory has departed. And as he did that, he went to the Mount of Olives because this was clearly a symbolic place in the plan of redemption. And as he went out there and as he declared this anathema and he clearly announced to them looking at Jerusalem, looking at the wall, looking at the temple, he told them that it was going to be destroyed. He said, not one stone is going to be left uh, here. One stone, truly I say to you, there will not be left here. One stone upon another that will not be thrown down. It's going to be destroyed. That's what Jesus told them. This is going to happen. This is going to crumble down. This is going to be decimated. And as Jesus told that to his disciples, uh, they, they had some questions, right? Like, understandably so. Let me put it in context. Jesus was basically saying, hey, life as you knew it is about to be completely transformed and changed, right? Like, like this, this, this entire system of governance that you knew is about to be done away with. So it was more than just the sacrifices. It was actually their entire life. Uh, I that's the question or the announcement Jesus made to them. So understandable that they had some questions, right? And their, their questions were this. Um, some have said that there's three questions uh, or two, I believe there's two, but basically the questions were this. When and what? When and what? When is this gonna happen? And what do I need to look for? That's what the disciples asked him. So it was a question of, of timing. So in verse three, tell us when will these things be? First question. And then what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So some have said coming is another question and end of the age is one, I think they're attached together. He's saying they're recognizing when is your coming and the end of the age going to be? When is this going to happen? That's 
what they wanted to know, right? So when is the end of the age going to come? And what is the sign? Notice that the sign here is not in the plural, it's in the singular. What is the sign that we are to look for when this is to take place? So Jesus clearly, most clearly answered the question of when in verse 34. So when we work through this at verse 34, if you recall, Jesus told them this, right? He said, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all of these things take place. So when, it, when are you coming? When is the end of the age? And the end of the age here is referring to, to what? The end of the, the, the old covenant age, right? The end of the Jewish age. It's not the end of the world as we know it, but he's here clearly talking about something local because he, he's connecting the destruction of the temple to the end of the age. That's in the same conversation. And he tells them that it's going to happen in your generation. Now this word generation is used some, I forget the exact amount, 20 some other times in the book of Matthew. Every other time it is used, it's always interpreted to mean that generation, right? Every other time it's used, no one, everyone understood that he meant roughly a 40 year period. And it would only make sense that also given here in this context that it means the same thing, right? These events are going to happen in your generation going to take place. So the, the question of when, he really tells them, it's going to happen in your lifetime. It's going to happen in your generation. But the second question is, what is the sign that we are to look for of your coming of the end of the age? What is the sign that we are going to see that the, your, your coming, your, your parousia is, is eminent? And that's what I'm going to spend my time talking about today, is there is a sign in this text not signs, there's one particular sign that Jesus focused on. And he said, when you see this, know that the end is near. But before he went into that sign, he told them a lot of what we will refer to as false signs uh, from verses three until verse 14. Verse three through 14 are here a series of false signs. Not false in the sense that they didn't happen, but false in the sense that Jesus said, when you see these things, know that the end is not here. These things are going to happen, but they are not an indication that the end is near. And it's, we're gonna, it's gonna be really interesting when we go through these, and I'm gonna apply it to our modern context today, because these false signs are what most contemporary Christians use as the genuine signs of the end of the age now, but Jesus was like, no, when you see these things, know that the end is not near. These, these, this is not an indication that the end is near. So they're actually false signs, but there are things that will take place. So to summarize in these verses, Jesus told them that there would be false prophets, false messiahs, false teachers, false doctrines. These things would arise in their generation. So Jesus gave this message in roughly 30 AD, and he was telling them after this, you are going to see the rising of many false teachers, false prophets. Many people are going to be led astray. If you recall back to when we read this, it was mentioned several times, right? Read through these verses again, and he references this several times. Know that this is going to take place. Many people will come in my name saying that they are a Christ. There will be many false prophets. Many will be led astray. This is going to happen. That's what Jesus told them. Uh, specifically, verse Five, many, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Verse 11, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Now, here's the really cool thing, guys. Like we have recorded, uh, we have written down for us, we can actually read the events, the major events that took place from the time that Jesus made this message announced this message until 70 AD. And if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's called the New Testament. Like we don't even have to go, which Josephus and Tacitus and these historians, they, they, they verify many good things, but actually on these points, we can look through the New Testament and we can see that this clearly happened. And again, remember, these people were actually writing to the audience of their time, not to America today. I know that's hard for us to get our minds around, right? 
Like the Apostle Paul was sitting down and saying, forget about these people, I'm thinking about America and I'm gonna give them a message, right? America, I'm gonna tell them what they need to do. No, he was writing to his people, right? And all these authors were. So uh, there's so many examples of this first, first one of these struggles in the early church of false teachers, false prophets, people being led astray. There are so many, I could have spent the entire message talking about that, but I'll just give you a few examples. First of all, the book of Galatians. Anyone recall the theme of the book of Galatians, right? No other gospel. It's like the theme. There's false teachers that, that, that had risen to a level of influence in the church. They were teaching them that the, the ground of their justification, that is their, stand, their right standing before God, the ground that they were standing on to be accepted before God was faith in Jesus and circumcision. So, so Paul was addressing that. And in Galatians chapter one, verses six through nine, he says this, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. So he's saying that that's what's happening then, right? Again, original context. This is not written to us. He says, I'm astonished of how many of you are turning to another gospel, are being led astray. I am absolutely astonished. And he says this, which is, really no gospel at all, right? The false gospel, a different gospel is really no gospel. It says, evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Or let me say it this way, anathema. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. So does that sound like they were having a major problem with false teachers, people being led astray, right? All right, let's move on. 1 Timothy 1, verses three through seven. This is what Paul said here. As I urged you when I was in Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Which means that they're, what were people doing? They were teaching different doctrines, right? Yeah, good job, class. Nor devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they may confident assertions. So now we're talking about the church of Ephesus. And later on in this chapter, Paul said this to Timothy. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme." We don't speak that way in our culture today, do we? I read something recently that Tom Askell, if anyone's followed him, is getting in trouble because he said that a person who rejects Christ is gonna go to hell. And he said, I miss the days that we could say that if people reject Christ, they're gonna go to hell. So uh, Paul was pretty blunt, right? He probably wouldn't have got sponsored to plant a church with those words. They, they weren't relevant enough um, but he is pretty, pretty blunt and pretty clear. But the issue is, right, what's he saying? He's saying there are people that are making a shipwreck of their faith. There are people that are false teachers. This is happening. Stand firm, Timothy. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, which Nick hit on last week, which I'm going to bring out again because notice what, what Paul says here. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and are being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word, 
or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So this letter that people would have been presenting as being authoritative, right? False teaching, false doctrine, impersonating it. Second Peter chapter two, verse one. Here's what Peter says, and this one was written in the, the, the 60s. So we're getting really close to intense things happening. And Peter says this, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing themselves swift destruction. And again, you could spend a lot more time. I was just cracking the surface. So when Jesus said that there will be this great uh, falling away, a rising of false teachers, when you read through the New Testament, it seems to be a pretty common theme, right? Which means it was happening in that time. So that's one point. Second, let's go to another one of these false signs, and it's the wars and rumors of wars. Verse six, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. See, that's where we're getting the false sign from, right? Like these things will happen, but don't be alarmed. <laughs> don't, don't freak out, don't worry. Verse seven, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And then I'll pick up the rest of that verse here. So wars and rumors of wars, which most end time uh, theology today talks about wars and rumors of wars being signed of the end of the age in our era now. But Jesus said there will be wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. Don't worry, don't be alarmed. But this is even more significant in the time that Jesus stated this because during this time, there was a peace treaty known as the Pax Romana. This term literally means Roman peace. And it was initiated in around 31 BC by Augustus. And this was a declaration by Rome that they were no longer going to conquer by the sword, but they wanted to conquer by the rule of law. And, they want, and their desire was to maintain peace. And up until that time, until right around the time Jesus was making this statement, there was relative peace. It was actually around the time um, in 27 AD that things began to shake up a little bit when Pilate was elected the governor. And it was here that the relationship between Rome and the Jews began to deteriorate. Up until that time, it was fairly stable. And we know that this climaxed this friction in relationship really climaxed in the Jewish rebellion, which began in 66 AD, which the Jewish war lasted from 66 to 73 AD, which was seven years, tribulation. That's another message we'll hit on. Um, so it, it began in, in, in 66, and this took place, which also was verified in the word of God that this, this rebellion would ha happen before the end came in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, which we heard last week. The word of God says, let no one deceive you in any way for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. So that, that, that day, the end of the day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. So the rebellion came in 66 AD. And also says that in the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. So let me move on. I have another quote here just talking about um, how the rebellion began, but we'll hit on that another time, or I can send it to you if you really want to read it. But let's talk about famines. So we've got false teachers, false prophets, false messiahs. We've got wars and rumors of wars, and we've, we have famines. Uh, again, read through the New Testament, and there was a really large famine that took place, Right? Uh, actually, roughly in like the 50s, and it, climbed, it got worse in the 60s up to 70 AD, which it got so bad that a mom actually cooked her own child and ate the child, um, which was recorded in history. That's, that's how bad and devastating this was. But we read about it earlier. So he said there, there will be famines. This, this will take place. Acts 11, 27 through 29 now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and 
foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over the whole world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. Then we actually read about the church sending this relief. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 3. Now concerning the collection for the saints as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you are also to do. On the first day of every week, each of you put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredited by a letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. It's a great famine going on, right? That's why they, they needed relief. Um, one other reference in the book of Romans. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints of Jerusalem. So here we have famine. And then you can read Josephus, and he talks about this a lot more, the historian, but I'm trying to stay as close as I can to just the New Testament record for us. What about earthquakes? Jesus told them there would be earthquakes, but again, that doesn't mean the end is near, but these will happen. We read of three earthquakes in the New Testament. One was when Jesus was crucified. So he, remember, he made this announcement before he was actually crucified. When he was crucified, there was a great earthquake. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. Another earthquake at the time of the resurrection. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back a stone and sat on it. In the book of Acts, are you guys tracking with me? I have a bunch of verses here because I want to drive this point home. That it's very, very clear. In the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 26, Paul and Silas are in prison. And what happened? And suddenly there was a great earthquake, right? A large earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. So here we have earthquakes took place, right? What about the death of the disciples? Which is what Jesus told them, right? Then they will deliver you up to tribulation, put you to death, and you will be hated by all names from by all nations for my name's sake. He, it's really encouraging, right? <laughs> Go, guys, you're all gonna die. But actually, they didn't. What happened is they, they were promoted uh, to the army in heaven, where it says in the army in heaven that they actually judge the angels. And if you are to judge, you're actually to make accusations. So they were busy, right? Actually got a promotion. But, but nonetheless, that's what he, what he told them. And what we have in the word of God from 44 AD until roughly about 80 AD, all of the disciples, this group that he was talking to, except for John, were killed and were crucified. Peter and Paul, the primary leaders, were crucified right around 65, 66 AD, right around the time of the rebellion and revolt. So that's what we have, right? And then John, he, he, he wasn't uh, put to death, but he was tortured very bad and exiled to the island of Patmos. But here we have this. So this took place. What about an increasing in lawlessness leading to love growing cold? Uh, we see here verse 10, and many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Verse 12, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. And there seems to be a connection here of love growing cold, lawlessness, these things happening. And again, jo Flavius Josephus, he, he writes a lot about how wicked Jerusalem had, had become during this time. But I'm just going to stick with a New Testament letter and, and cause you to flesh out a theme of one letter in the New Testament. John's letter. Just stick with 1 John. What was the theme of 1 John? Uh, love, and you prove your love by obeying God's commandments. What's the opposite of that? Your love growing cold and being lawless. So what was obviously going on during the church that time? Again, this was penned in the 60s. So this is like things are getting close to the end. Like obviously there was a huge issue in the church 
of them having their love grow cold and rejecting the law of God, the commandments of God, the commandments of Christ. And John basically says, hey, if you're not obeying God's commandments, you're not a Christian. If you don't love, you're not a Christian. Let's not confuse this issue. And this was the thrust of his entire letter. Let me give you a few examples. 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. What does it mean to love? This is not confusing. It means to keep his commandments. How do we know if we're loving? We're loving when we keep God's commandments. We're not loving when we have some ushy-gushy feeling. Or we're nice to someone, you know, we say things with a smile on our face, but have envy and bitterness and hatred in our hearts. That's not love. Love is the keeping of God's commandments. They go hand in hand. A, law, a, a people who are an obedient people will be a loving people. A lawless people will be an unloving people. They go hand in hand, and that is the thrust of what John was hitting at here. And then he also says that um, many of them left and they departed because of their lawlessness and their love going cold. And he said this in 1 John two nineteen. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it, might be, that it might become plain that they are all not of us. So that is not a verse that we apply to members when they leave our church, as many churches have sadly done. <laughs> like if they're still Christians, like they did not leave he was talking about something bigger. He was saying that they left us, they departed from the faith. Their love grew cold. They, they were not of us. Well, let me hit on one final thing, and, and that is the, the gospel of the kingdom being proclaimed throughout the whole world. And I'll say that this happened. Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So this is the part where a lot of people would say, well, see, that's future because that hasn't happened yet. The gospel has not been proclaimed throughout the whole world. And I would say, yeah, it, it hasn't in this era that we're living in. It hasn't gone to all nations However, this is where context is really important again because we read in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 8 that Paul said this. He said, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you, you all, for, I'm sorry, for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the... So do we think that Paul was saying that I thank you that your faith was proclaimed in all the world in 2021? That's what the same thing we do with what Matthew said. So here he says that the whole world knew about the faith of, uh, of the Romans. So presumably the whole world knew about the gospel of the kingdom. So he obviously had in mind here the known world of that time, primarily the, the world of the Roman Empire. And he's saying when the gospel goes out to this known world, then after that the, the end will come, which he verifies here in Romans so I know I belabored this point and I did that very, very intentionally. And again, I might be accused of this message being heady, but that's okay. Um, because I need to make this very important point. That Jesus was telling the listeners of that time that these things would happen and that they did happen, but they were not the sign of the end to look for. All that I went through those were not the, the thing to look for to discern that the end was near. You guys see that? Is that not clear? Right? He's saying these things will happen. And because this is so important, because even if you reject the position that I have here in Matthew 24, you have to accept that these are still false signs. So what we need to uh, stop doing is we need to stop abusing this text of scripture and taking it out of t context. And every time there's a war or r rumors of war or false teaching or lawlessness or these things take place, people hunker down and they say, Jesus is returning. And Jesus clearly says here that those are not the signs to look for. 
So Jesus says this, so what do we do in our contemporary society today? We look at these signs and we make charts and graphs about them indicating that the end is near, right? We write books and produce an endless number of videos connecting the dots together saying that the end is near. Let me say this clear. This is to live in error. It's to misapply the word of God and it will lead you to the dark side. To quote, I just popped in my head, but too much Star Wars, I guess. It will lead you to walk in darkness. Satan has used our fascination with wars and rumors of wars as a drug to keep us distracted from kingdom building. We have become intoxicated on the millennium. So here's what the Church of Christ needs to do is we need to put the drug down and walk in the light. And understand that throughout history, that's why Jesus said these were not the signs. There's been wars, right? There's been some horrendous wars throughout history. Has there not been? Like how many are we in right now, right? Like we forget about it. It becomes so normal. Like, oh yeah, we're just always fighting wars. Are there, is there a lot of lawlessness in our culture right now? Has there been a lot of lawlessness throughout all of history? in many different nations, right? Have, have there been a lot of false teachers, a lot of heresies, a lot of people leading astray? Like this stuff has continued to happen. That's why Jesus said, those are not the signs of the end. They will happen, but those aren't the signs. And, and, and then he, he tells them, I'm gonna tell you what the sign to look for, that the end is near, and by the end being near during that time, being the destruction of Jerusalem and the ending of the old covenant era. So let's move into the true sign now. Take a deep breath. Yeah, there you go. One person listened. Yeah. All right, so the sign, the main sign, this is when you know things are serious, Jesus says. When you see, verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That's the sign. And then in Luke's account, he says this to help us to uh, interpret who the abomination of desolation is, right? In Luke's account of this, he says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart and let not those who are in, who are out in the country enter it, for these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. So who is the abomination of desolation? It's Rome. <laughs> and when they're surrounding you, and then when they come to desecrate your temple, you know that the end is near. And when this happens, these are the days of vengeance. You are to flee to the mountain. That's what Jesus was telling them. This was the major announcement that Jesus had for them. This was prophesied in the book of Daniel that the abomination of desolation, which the abomination means a foul and detestable thing, and desolation means to make desolate, to to do away with, he was saying was Rome. And when these things happen, when you're surrounded, when 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 they go after the, the, the temple, the end is near, and you have one thing that you are to do. You have one job. Flee, flee to the mountains. That is what Jesus told them to do. And we know that Rome is referred to as the abomination. And again, read through history and you will see the wicked things that took place in in Rome. Um, Sodomy, um, exposure. They would, kids would be born and they would leave them out to under the, to be exposed and die. Um, Just, just, wicked, abominable things that took place. And then they make things desolate. They're an army, right? They know how to kill people. They know how to conquer. So he says, when these happen, it's time for you to flee. When you see these things, know that the end is near. Know that it is imminent. Know that the coming of Jesus on the clouds, that is coming in judgment, is is about to happen too. And this city is going to be destroyed. And he told them to flee. 
And we know in the year 66 AD, the Jews of Judea rebelled against their Roman masters. And this is why. In response, the Emperor Nero dispatched an army under the generalship of Vespasian to restore order. By the year 68, resistance in the northern part of the province had been eradicated, and the Romans turned their full attention to the subjugation of Jerusalem. That same year, the Emperor Nero died. And I'm probably gonna hit on that at some point. I know Nick touched on it last time, but there's uh, some really interesting things about how he died. Like in Thessalonians, it talked about that he would die by the breath of God and some really strange things around his death that perhaps it was. He died. I know. That same year, the, the Emperor Nero died, creating a vacuum, a power vacuum in Rome. In the result of chaos, Vespasian was declared emperor and returned to the imperial city. It fell to his son Titus to lead the remaining army in the assault on Jerusalem. The Roman legions surrounded the city and began to slowly squeeze the life out of the Jewish strongholds. By the year 70, the attackers had breached Jerusalem's outer walls and began a systematic ransacking of the city. The assault culminated in the burning and destruction of the temple that served as the center of Judaism. In victory, the Romans slaughtered thousands. Of those spared from death, thousands more were enslaved and sent to the toil of the mines in Egypt. And when actually it was all said and done, they, they killed millions. 1.1 million roughly recorded. The temple's sacred relics were taken to Rome where they were displayed in celebration of the victory, the rebellion sputtered on for another three years and was finally extinguished in 73 AD with the fall of various pockets of resistance, including the stronghold at Masada. So here we have this rebellion took place and part of the rebellion took place because they started to remove their sacrifices and this caused Rome, or I'm sorry, the Jews to revolt and then Rome came in and annihilated them and desolated them. But when these things happened, the people of God believed the words of Jesus and they fled. Absolutely astonishing. Jesus told them when they saw the sign of the abomination of desolation surrounding the city and the desecration of the holy place that they were to do one thing. They were to flee. And he said, pray that this doesn't happen in the winter or on the Sabbath. Because the only thing that you must do in that moment is you must get out of Dodge. And history reveals that the, this prophecy was realized, but it also reveals the stunning fact that the believers obeyed the warnings and they fled when this happened to a town called Pella in the mountains and saved themselves. Here's what Eusebius said, Eusebius. The whole body, however, of the church at Jerusalem, having been commanded by divine revelation given to men of approved piety, that before the war removed from the city and dwelt at a certain town beyond the Jordan called Pella. And another historian said this, as Vespasian was approaching with his army, all who believed in Christ left Jerusalem and fled to Pella and other places beyond the river Jordan. And so they marvelously escaped the general shipwreck of their country. Not one of them perished. God's elect were spared, friends. The elect of God were spared. That's why in verse 13, he says, the one who endures to the end will be saved. And he talks about here of the love for the elect of God and in those days, if, if those days had not been cut short, no human being would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And we see these promises of God, and we recognize and we realize that God spared his elect. Isn't that a beautiful thing to think about? On record, at least 1.1 million Jews were slaughtered, which is horrendous. Over 100,000 were taken prisoner yet we don't have on record that one of God's children were killed in that siege. The elect of God were spared. So there, in light of all this, I want us to walk away with some things here today. 
one thing I want us to walk away with is to re, uh, remember and realize that God is very, very concerned about the preservation of his elect. God loves his children, right? Like, think about this for a moment. Like, God made you. Everyone here is made in the image and likeness of God. And when he made you, he, he made you unique. There is no one else like you. You are the only person that's you out of all of creation, out of all of history. And then as believers, we're being remade in the image of Jesus Christ. That is, he has declared his love to us by sending his son to die for us and to continue to, to make us more of the virtuous version of ourselves that he created us to be, right? Like that's, that's how amazing God is. And God sent his son to die for us even though we were sinful and rebellious people. Like we put higher standards on ourselves than God often does, right? How many of us can try to be perfectionists and God said, no, I sent you a perfect one because you're not perfect, bro. So stop trying. Just look to the one that is perfect. Like God loves his elect and God preserves his elect. It is through the elect of God that this world is salted over with the glory of God. That is how God works. And sometimes the preservation of the elect would mean to flee, to escape the judgment of beastly governments. God, Jesus gave them specific instructions to do this very thing. Fleeing is not necessarily cowardice. The goal of God's elect should never be martyrdom. The goal of God's elect should always be dominion. Now some will be martyred, some will be persecuted. This will take place and when that happens, we know that they join the heavenly army, but the goal should never be martyrdom, it should be dominion. And dominion is accomplished through God's elect bringing heaven down to earth. Not escaping this, right? Most of us say, things are going to hell in a handbasket, so I wanna escape, and God says, no, I wanna keep you there so you can bring heaven down to earth. And God preserves his elect even through judgment, even through hard times. And here we see the people of God because they obeyed the words of Jesus. They obeyed the words of Jesus. They believed and they obeyed. And when these things happened, they fled and they were saved from destruction. And the same thing is true for you and I, right? When we believe and obey the words of Jesus, we will be saved, we will be spared. We will be delivered. It is our belief that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life in obeying his words throughout our life. Now, believing and obeying the words of Jesus will not earn us style points in our culture today, will it? That doesn't matter. Because it really comes down to, do we want to trust the words of only perfect man in history who died on a bloody cross, who conquered the grave, who ascended into heaven, and who is now ruling and reigning as king, or do we want to listen to the words of a secular government that doesn't know how to balance a budget? We can decide, right? God preserves his elect. It's not, things aren't getting worse. They're getting better. We have no idea what the future of America is going to be, but I know the future of the kingdom of God is getting better. He will be victorious and he will reign. And our duty, just like these people, is to believe and obey. That's what we are to do. And we know things in our nation are getting sketchier and sketchier. As Nick prayed for, there's a pastor in Canada that got arrested for having church services and preaching the gospel. And know this, whenever someone is arrested, they're never gonna say they were arrested for preaching the gospel. They're gonna say they were arrested for violating the government dictates and crimes. So when the church's Christians say, well, he wasn't arrested for preaching the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they always say, right? They don't, they're not gonna say, well, yeah, he was arrested for preaching this life-giving message. No, he was arrested for disobeying our orders. That's That's happening. Things don't change, it's gonna happen here as well. It's going to happen in America. But what we need to realize is we, we, we are not to be pessimistic and fearful because God preserves his elect in history and God will continue to build his church. Not one Christian was harmed in this siege. 
And we are in God's hands and he determines our future, does he not? So if we trust him, we obey him, we know that he will continue to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, friends. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. So let us, as we leave here today, strive to keep obeying the words of Christ as the early church did and watch how God turns the world upside down through our obedience and through our worship. So let's worship the King. Father in heaven, God, we wanna understand your word. We wanna understand the context. We wanna understand the application. We wanna understand it all so that we can divide it and apply it properly in the age that we live in, Lord. So God, I pray for the church at large that we would stop our obsession with these false signs and stop looking for all of these things and simply look to your words and say, uh, we, we are to obey you, to worship you, and to know that these events will transpire throughout all of history. And the sign that we are to look for now, we know of the end coming, is when your gospel will reach the entire world and there'll be a worldwide revival. That all nations will know about you, Lord, and we're not there yet. We know that to await your second coming, this will take place. So for now, may we not be worried. May we not be anxious. Uh, may we not fret. And I pray that we as a people of God will simply humbly obey and continue to worship and trust you and watch you as you continue to claim dominion throughout this world. And Father, we just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.